Hello and welcome back to Bumblebee viewers for today's video on the top 10 most powerful dynasties that ruled the world. Dynasty number 10 is the Rashidun Caliphate, which followed the death of Muhammad himself in 632 CE, which is 11 Anno Hegriae, which I hope I said right. While Muhammad had a small religious polity in Medina under his prophetic leadership, he didn't create anything that might have been called an empire. That was done by the four caliphs of the Rashidun period, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali, who oversaw the rapid expansion of the Islamic polities throughout the Near East. During its existence, the empire was most powerful economic, cultural, and military force in West Asia. They had established Muslim power in the centers of the ancient world's civilizations, namely Levant, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Persia, in just a couple decades. Rashidun Caliphates have the real credit for transforming what started as just the Muslim power in Arabia to a major regional power by vanquishing the Bayezidine Romans and the Sassanid Persians, both of which were the major powers of the ancient world in many battles. In the end, the Rashidun covered more than 3 million square miles of land, which is almost 6% of the Earth's land mass. And despite becoming a caliphate or religiously governed empire under their new rulers, the conquered countries, towns, and capitals of other faiths were always given good treatment in this empire. They were allowed freedom to practice their own religion as long as they paid taxes to the caliphate. The Rashidun is often considered a religio-political golden age as a result, and it also witnessed many fierce debates about the nature of authority, the role of the caliphate, and the relationship between religion and politics, which would be the end of this empire. A civil war permanently divided the young Muslim community and revealed the incredible difficulty of simultaneously ruling a huge empire and maintaining religious unity. Dynasty number nine is Umayyad Caliphate. Umayyads inherited the right of the original Arab caliphate, the Rashidun Caliphate, despite being founded in Mecca. The Umayyad Caliphate, whose name comes from the great-grandfather of the first Umayyad Caliph, ruled between 661 and 750 AD. Thus, the Umayyads emerged as the emperors or caliphs in an already super well-established empire with the mightiest armies the world had already ever seen. Now, we still gotta run them their independent cred, though, because the Umayyads transformed the new major regional power into a world superpower all by pushing the new established base of the Muslim world even further, both westwards and eastwards, to cover a whopping 5.02 million square miles of land at their largest, so more than 8% of the Earth's land mass. The empire had 62 million people between 720 and 750, and that's nearly 30% of the world's population at the time. The most important factor that contributed to their superiority was that unlike the Rashidun Caliphate before them, the Unamids had the advantage that Islam was beginning to spread among non-Arab populations. For example, the Umayyads army had been diversified, having Arab Yemeni warriors and newly converted Syrians. So when they rolled into Iberia and their ethnic composition was not what the Iberians had expected, the Unamids took advantage of their lowered guard to avoid bloodshed and were able to spread Islam and recruit even more soldiers. Essentially, the Umayyad Caliphate established formidable multiracial mixing pot Muslim armies that made relations or conversation with foreign nationals all the easier. Dynasty number eight is the Habsburgs. Ultimately, this group is a dynasty, and they sure as hell were a long and far spread one, even if their family tree was quite uh, tight knit, if you know what I mean. The Habsburgs dynasty ran from 1273 to 1918. One of the earliest Habsburgs to rise to the great power was Rudolf I, who became the German king in 1273. Frederick IV, the Habsburgs king of Germany, was crowned the Holy Roman Emperor in 1452, and the Habsburgs continued to hold that title until 1806. Frederick's son, Maximilian I, acquired the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and Burgundy through marriage. The zenith of the Habsburg's power came in the 16th century under the Emperor Charles V. In total, this family had multiple members elected to Holy Roman Emperors. They reigned Austria for six centuries. Through marriages, they were able to put Habsburgs into power in every kingdom they could possibly find a cousin to marry someone to in. Burgundy, Spain, Bohemia, Hungary, the list goes on. I'm not kidding about the cousin thing either, dude. The family motto quite literally was, let others wage wars, but you happy Austria shall marry. Obviously a reference to why wage war for a country when you can marry your daughter to its heir. That's all girls are good for anyway, right? After the fall of the Holy Roman Empire, the Habsburgs simply made a new empire, the Austrian aka Hungarian Empire, which they ruled until the end of World 
War I. Dynasty number seven is the Qing Dynasty. The Qing Dynasty covered 5.68 million square miles of land, which is nearly 10% of the Earth's land mass, and now can be remembered as not only the most populous empire that's ever been had on Earth, it was 432 million people in 1851, by the way, which is more than 35% of the world's population. But they're also remembered as China's last great empire. Founded when the Chinese defeated the Mongols, the Qing Dynasty ruled China from the 17th to the 20th century with the height of its power and reaching peak in the 1800s. The Republic of China took over the government at the end of the Qing Dynasty. The Manchus were persistent. After the dynasty's founder, Nurhaci, died in 1626, his son conquered more territory and defeated Korea, and then armies under his grandson conquered Beijing in 1644. His great-great-grandson finally subdued the Ming Empire in 1683. All in all, that means their campaign for the region that is now modern China lasted 57 years after Nuhachi died. The reason this empire went down was actually the combination of natural catastrophes like the Yellow River floods and famines, but also political corruption and discourse leading to events such as the Taiping Rebellion. Dynasty number six is the Rurik Dynasty, who ruled over Russian territories for a whopping 700 years, from 862 to 1610. The dynasty and its princes of Kivian Rus and later Muscovy were descendants of a Bulgarian Viking prince Rurik, who had, so the legend says, been invited by the people of Novgorod to rule the city in 862. This Russian dynasty played a major role in history, leading the country through Christianization and into the beginning of the modern period. Rurik's successor Oleg conquered Kiev and established control of the trade route extending from Novgorod across the Dnieper River to the Black Sea. Kiev became the leading city of Eastern Europe and the seat of the first East Slav polity, the Kievan Ru. Within 200 years of Rurik rule, Vladimir, also called Saint Vladimir, introduced all the trappings of a medieval European state. He promulgated the first law code for Kievan Rus, organized a confederation of major cities to be ruled by his sons, and introduced Christianity to the East Slavs thanks to his new boo and Byazantine queen. Oh, and he consolidated the state of Kievan Rus to include the modern day Baltic Sea region, including Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia. Other great Rurik leaders continued in succession, bringing more fame to the Rurik dynasty and expanding the power of the Kivian Ru. According to ancient origins, Vladimir's son, Yaroslav the Wise, brought the state to its zenith in cultural and military importance and laid the foundations for crucial code of law for the state. However, after his death, the Rurik dynasty split into three princely cadet branches, the heads of each styling themselves as a grand prince. From that point on, it became a loosely formed state and the Rurik dynasty broke up into sub-dynasties, each one ruling distinct principalities and claiming descent from the Rurik of old. Dynasty number five is the Medicis. These guys were a powerful dynasty during the 13th to 17th centuries, similar to the Habsburgs in the sense that their power came from titles and claims and made up social crap, unlike some older era dynasties where it's quite literally about the land and the buildings. The Medicis were one of the wealthiest families in Europe. They managed to crap out three popes, two queens, and were part of the French and English royalty. In 1397, Giovanni di Bici de' Medici started a bank in Florence on which the Medici fortune was built, which consequently led to them controlling all of Florence and financially funding and carrying the Italian Renaissance. They straight up had teenage Michelangelo crash at their place while he was in art school. The family's roots are linked to one of Charlemagne's 8th century knights named Avarado. The legend says Avarado was riding through Mugolello, Florence, when he encountered a giant who had been frightening people and armed with a giant spiky ball thing. So he fought it and killed it. The Medici family coat of arms, which includes red balls on a gold shield, supposedly was inspired by Avaradero and his battered shield. The curtains closed on almost 300 years of Medici rule in Florence with the death of Gian Gaston de Medici, the seventh family member to serve the Grand Duke of Tuscany. Gian Gaston, who came into power in 1723 and led a life of debauchery, died without any heirs. Anna Maria Luisa de Medici, the last of the family line, passed away in 1743 without any children, and she willed the Medici's enormous art collection and other treasures to the Tuscan state on the condition they always remain in Florence. Dynasty number four is the Mughals, founded by disowned Timurud prince Babur, who moseyed himself away from his family and re-established himself in Kabul. From there, he conquered the Punjab and subsequently unseated Delhi Sultanate before extending his rule across northern India. According to Britannica, by the death of Akbar, the third Mughal ruler, the Mughal Empire extended from Afghanistan to the Bay of Bengal and southward to what's now Gujarat state and the northern Dekka region of India. The Mughal Empire was important for bringing almost the entire 
entire Indian subcontinent under one domain for the first time ever, which meant drawing the subcontinent together through overland and coastal trading networks, policy, and some good old-fashioned charisma. It also is known for its cultural influence as a result, having joined so many influential groups, their arts, musics, and ideologies began to correlate and intermix. And let's not forget the architectural achievements, I mean, come on, the Taj Mahal. The Mughal Empire began to decline in the 18th century during the reign of Muhammad Shah, which started in 1719 and ended 29 years later in 1748. The Mughal territory began to fall under the control of the Marathas and then the worst of all worst people that can take control of your land, the British. The last Mughal Empire, Babadar Shah II, was exiled by the British after his involvement with the Indian Mutiny of 1857. Dynasty number three is the Mongols. Fun fact, first Mughal Emperor Babur hailed from the Barlas tribe, which was of Mongol origin. How could they not come up? Defeated by the king, the Mongols' empire was uneffing believable. They had 9.15 million square miles of land, which means that's 16% of Earth's land mass. As for population, at its peak from 1270 to 1309, there's 110 million people living in the empire, which means more than 25% of the world's population. The Mongols get to be remembered for many things, such as being the largest continuous empire in history and emerging from the unification of Mongol and Turkish tribes under Genghis Khan. The craziest thing about it is that these lands were accumulated in just 86 years. According to the Guardian report, Genghis Khan and his army estimated 40 million people during their campaigns. Between 1236 and 1260, Mongols invaded and defeated Korea and the Song Dynasty of China. Meanwhile, they defeated the small kingdoms in the regions of Armenia, Georgia, Hungary, Bulgaria, Vietnam, Syria, Egyptian Mamluks, etc. The Mongols achieved advancements in various technologies, ideologies, cultural exchanges, and warfare advancements during the empire. In 1331, the Black Death began to rampage in Mongolia and brought the empire in long, slow decline that culminated with its annexation by Russia in 1783. Dynasty number two is the Second French Empire. It was one of the largest in history and its colonies and dependencies stretching across 4.44 million square miles at its peak of its power. The empire began in the early to mid 19th century, succeeding the first French colonial empire. France once held many colonial possessions around the world, which is just a nice way to say they decided they owned countries and lands even if the indigenous peoples on them had no concept of what that meant. Its largest possessions were in Africa, while the smaller colonies were spread throughout the Americas, Caribbean, and South Pacific. After World War II, most of these territories were granted independence or autonomy from France, along with their own currencies and governments. Currently, the leftovers of this vast empire are scattered throughout the islands in the Atlantic, Pacific, India, and Southern Oceans, as well as the mainland territory located in South America for a total area of around 47,548 square miles combined today. These remaining French territories have unique traditions that reflect both their colonial past as well as their colonized local culture, which has been preserved over time but still requires reconnection and ancestral help to recover from being so damaged. Dynasty number one is the Achaemenid Empire. So the Achaemenid Empire was one of the largest empires in history, reaching its peak size during Cyrus the Great, who founded the empire, when it covered a territory of 5 million square kilometers, the first of its kind that size. More than 70 plus different ethnicities lived within its borders, from the Persians, the Greeks, the Phonicans, the Medes, the Thraticans, and Egyptians, to Macedonians, Arabians, Libyans, and so on. Needless to say, the empire was very diverse and very strong military-wise as a result, just like our Unamed dynasty from point two. This diverse army makes it easier for you to interact with the colonies you approach, whether your intent is to trade, buy, convert, or preach. It aided in letting folks guard down and feeling more open to their forces. Darius I established the first navy in the empire, and the personnel consisted mostly of Egyptians, Greeks, and Phoenicians. After Cyrus the Great conquered Babylon, he allowed the Jewish people to return to Israel and rebuild their temple at Jerusalem. What made this empire different from the others was its acceptance of people's different origins and faiths. People were allowed to practice their religion without being discriminated against, and this tolerance attracted many citizens from nearby. Other kingdoms didn't grant such freedoms during this era, and by doing so, this was a covert and genius tactic at expanding an empire. People go where they're accepted and can be themselves.
cult. One of the reasons the Empire was able to exist and thrive for so long is the fact that Cyrus the Great implemented the Satrap Satrapi system, aka he created a multi-state empire similar to the crap we've got going on in modern times. Satraps were local governors of the area they got, each Satrapi was subject of some taxes, and all Satraps had to declare loyalty to Cyrus himself and the central government in general. That was one of the reasons the Empire experienced relative peace and harmony during its existence. Thanks once again for watching the Bumblebee channel, I hope you enjoyed. Take time to like and subscribe to see more of our content, maybe drop a comment down below. Bye!